I don't really do too many uh, presentations via webinar, so this is going to be a little bit uh, different for me. I'm used to uh, pacing around and flailing my arms, and now if I did that, it really wouldn't do anything for anybody else. So um, bear with me. So just kind of imagine that I'm just kind of uh, you know sitting here and uh, flailing my arms, I guess. Um, I'm I'm Rick Gosh. I'm the, the director of the Center for Mental Health Research and Innovation here at the University of Kansas, and I've been here since uh, 1999 at the university. I'm also uh, the co-author of the book, The Strengths Model, a Recovery-Oriented Approach to Mental Health Services, which is now in its third edition. But prior to come up to the university, uh, I've pretty much done most kind of positions within a mental health center and where I've been able to actually apply this model, use it, interact with clients and get that first-hand ability to see how it makes a difference with people. So I started off as a social work practicum student. I did case management uh, services for many years starting in the mid-1980s. I've been a frontline supervisor. Um, I've been a program manager at a mental health center as well as a director of a mental health center where we really aligned everything with this model in terms of policy, uh, our workflow procedures, everything that we did really became about this model. And when I came up to the university in 1999, what I was challenged with by Charlie Rapp, uh, the other co-author of the Strengths Model, was to how do we, how do we start to move this model out uh, from a single place, which was the agency that I ran, and have it to become something that we could do statewide. And so that's what I've been doing, helping to implement the strengths model of case management within our own state, as, long, as well as many other evidence-based practices like integrated dual disorders treatment, support employment, uh, family psychoeducation, et cetera. So we've really come up with a great model about, uh, or an infrastructure of how to kind of put these things into place. So my involvement with ARC has really been to how do we kind of take some of this beyond Kansas and be able to kind of share exactly how we do these things. And so the strengths model has become part of an overall change package, uh, recovery-oriented change package that the California Institute of Behavioral Health Services has put into place. And the teams that you're all part of have been participating in that and learning about the different components of the strengths model. So. This webinar here really is to allow you just to have a, a, an introduction, an overview of what this model is about. Um, so hopefully we'll make this as interactive as possible. We'll I'll, I'll start to kind of present a lot of things about it. We'll show some of the tools that are used in the model, uh, some actual case examples, and then give you a chance to kind of react and, and, and get your impressions. So go ahead and hit the next slide, Karen. So what is the strengths model of case management? Well, the, the strengths model was developed in the mid-1980s as a response to traditional deficit-based approaches uh, that have been prevalent in, in mental health uh, for years. And so the model's focus is on meaningful and important goal achievement and then mobilizing people's strengths to achieve those goals. So the model is both a philosophy of practice as well as it is a set of tools and methods that's designed to help enhance people's ability to recover and reclaim their lives. So we look at it from a philosophical perspective, some big components about it affects the way that we view the people that we serve. So in the strengths model, we would view that any person that we come in contact with has the capacity to make significant strides in their own journey of recovery. And a lot of that's based on the fact that we are very poor predictors on who will recover their life and who doesn't recover their life. So we don't even try to make that arbitrary choice. What we do is we view that, you know, a person who may have been using substances for 27 years or a person who has spent uh, a good portion of their life in and out of hospitals, that all of those individuals, when we come in contact with them, that we engage with them believing that people can make strides in their recovery. So there's hope and expectancy that's embedded within this model. It's also a way of being in relationship with the people that we serve. So you could kind of compare it more of like a traveling companion versus a travel agent. So we don't you know, just assess, diagnose, and treat, uh, point people to the services that uh, might help them in their recovery, but we actually help try to build those type of relationships where we actually follow along with people. And it's really, it's, a, it's, a, it's an intensive model, but the word that we use, it's more of an investment in people. 
It's a sincere investment that we truly believe that people can make uh, strides in their own recovery. And so we do what we can do to help people achieve the goals that are going to help them actually move beyond our systems of care. So the tools and methods, just a few of those that I put up there, the primary tools of the model is the strengths assessment and the personal recovery plan. And you'll get a chance to see both of those as we go through the webinar. There's also a few things that we build into the model like group supervision where the strengths assessment plays prominently and so rather than going through just a few clients, uh, I mean uh, you know an entire caseload, we actually really focus on a couple clients and help people make, help those clients to be able to remove barriers that might be getting in the way of them being able to achieve their goals in life. And then field mentoring is a, a structured supervisory practice which focuses on the fact that we need to help staff build their skills at doing this model. That it's not just something that you can go attend a training and then turn right around and just start doing. That we view the strengths model as a complex uh, set of skills, just like if you were learning motivational interviewing or dialectical behavioral therapy, that there's a lot that's involved in it that um, we want to help staff achieve the highest competence so they could be able to actually make a, a, an impact in people's um, um, recovery and, and outcomes. So go ahead and go to the next slide, Karen. Just some basic principles of the strengths model. And I'll kind of cover that already, the first one in, in the philosophy that we believe that people have the capacity to recover, reclaim, and transform their lives. And you know, we view that we don't make people recover, that what we do is that we help to create the conditions in which recovery is most likely to occur. So it's really a model that you really have to get in with people and start to understand what recovery means to them, which is a very subjective view from person to person. Um, and also working at a person's pace, which is always going to be different. And the second one is that the focus is on strengths versus n than deficits. And I want to make it really clear that the strengths model um, does not ignore problems, barriers, and challenges that people face. It's, um, a lot of people that are involved in the development of this model have the lived experience of mental illness and we know that uh, that journey of recovery can often be very messy for people, um, that people are faced with very real problems and challenges that make their life difficult, whether it's hearing distressing voices or racing thoughts or debilitating depression or you know, even some of the effects that come as a result of having mental illness. Uh, the, the fact that people experience poverty and, and housing sometimes is difficult. It's difficult to get jobs when people have large blanks in their resumes. But what we view is that how people build their lives is building on the strengths, not just the deficits, not just removing those deficits. In fact, we would view that a focus on strengths actually helps us to go through those problem barriers and challenges. And it's very similar to how we build our lives, that we do those things that we do well and we build on those competencies in the hope that we find a niche in our life where we can thrive. The third principle is that the community is viewed as an oasis of potential resources. So not only is there is a focus on the individual, but there's also a focus on the strengths of the community um, as well. So even though a lot of us experience pockets within the community where we see stigma and discrimination and blocked doors, that we view that every community also has strengths where people can find inclusion. So there's a lot about the model which is on focusing a niche where often people have to change very little and the community has to change very little. And that takes a very um, dedicated um, and invested uh, search for people's strengths and how to mobilize them. And number four, the client is the director of the helping process. And what this really means is not just that you know the client says they want something, we go get it. What it really means is that we involve the person as an expert in their own life. So they become involved in every aspect of their own treatment and care in making decisions. And so there's lots of focus on control and autonomy and really working from goals that are meaningful and important to the person that they drive the treatment plans that we set. The worker-client relationship is primary and essential. Um, you know, I talked about that there's tools in this model like the strength assessment and the personal recovery plan, but the absolute most important tool really is the worker themselves. You can take a worker who does not believe in people that, um, um, that they can become a barrier themselves and you put those kind of tools in their hands and you just end up with further deficit-based approaches. 
And so here we really look for a worker that really holds hope and expectancy for the people that they work with and really believe that they can actually help people mobilize strengths and achieve important goals in their life. And the last one is that the primary setting for our work is in the community. Now, our belief is that recovery doesn't happen within the walls of our mental health center. Um, all of us, where we find our own meaning and purpose is within the community. And it's the same for people with the lived experience of mental illness. And so when we think about helping people to live on their own or go to work, uh, we, try to, we try to buffer those supports uh, outside of our walls and where people are actually going to live and work and play. So we'll go to the next slide, Karen. Just want to set up just a little bit of context of strengths model practice. There's a, a handout that you should have all received that actually flushes this out a lot more, and so you'll have that for your own reference afterwards. But when I think about doing the strengths model, I don't like to kind of just, you know, piece all the components together, but really kind of think about what is the ultimate goal of even doing this practice? Um, how do we get the big picture so that when we start looking at individual components, we see how they all relate together? And for me, when I think about the strengths model, I like to put it in the context of the end of the story first. So then that would be the way that I would approach even working with any individual. You know, what is the end of the story that we're trying to actually move towards? And for us in mental health, that would be recovery. Now there's lots of different um, definitions of recovery, and I've even said before that there's a subjective aspect to what recovery is, but you know, the way that we always view it is that it's, it's somewhere embedded in meaning, purpose, and identity. You know, helping people find uh, meaningful things that, that give them life, um, that actually gives them a purpose, people contributing, and this positive sense of identity so that people's identity uh, when they meet other people isn't just that I'm a client of a mental health center, but that I'm an artist or I'm a student or I'm a mother or I'm a father or, um, you know, an athlete, you know, that our identity starts to extend beyond serious mental illness. So when we've kind of got that is that a lot of the tools and methods are really aimed at kind of shaping what that means for the purpose, for the person, and then being able to find ways for us to start making those linkages so they can move forward. So go ahead and go to the next, uh, the next part of that slide there. Um, you know, for, for, this isn't really on here, but, you know, one thing I always ask of my own staff that I've supervised, even before we start doing strengths model practice, is that are you ready to work with this individual? And we really think that's kind of an individualized thing. I mean, we can get into this field and say that we want to work with people with serious mental illness, but on a very individual level, we have to think about, you know, are you ready to work with Tom? Are you ready to work with Susan? And there's so much is really put on the worker in terms of um, that primacy of the relationship is, you know, asking people is that what is your belief in that person's ability to make strides in their re recovery and do you have a sincere commitment to that person who you're getting ready to work with? Do you, are you open to difference and uncertainty and even chaos because, as I said before, sometimes people's lives are extremely messy. Um, are you willing to advocate for the person? Are you willing to stay in that place where even sometimes a person may make decisions that you don't agree with are you always willing to stay curious and creative? So when we think about engagement, a lot of that engagement part is understanding hope and alliance. It's a real purposeful use of ourselves, taking a stance to continually try to understand what's meaningful and important to the person, uh, validating their lived experience, um, being aware of opportunities to form alliance and partnership so that when we have people work with us that our services are seen as relevant. You know, sometimes we, we, we don't think about that aspect of it too much that, you know, when people come into services, that's a very heroic effort that they make to actually try to seek help. And sometimes they come into services and they find that it's about, you know, just taking medications or going to groups or doing certain things. and. You know, not that those things aren't important, but we need to establish some relevancy and how do we align with the person so that maybe those things that we're helping them do actually do help them make forward movement in their recovery. So the next part of that slide is just that middle part is then that's where the methods and the tools come in. It's that bridge between that first point of contact that we have with a person, hopefully to the point that we actually help them achieve outcomes that are important in their life. So go ahead and go on to the next one, Karen. 
Um, Rick, we've not received any questions um, per se, so I think we're okay. Okay, and I'll, I'll give you a chance here to ask some questions here in a bit to, to give you some more preliminary stuff. Now, I haven't put up all the research that's been done on the strengths model. There, there's actually been 10 studies that have tested the effectiveness of the strengths model with people with a serious mental illness, and four of those studies have been experimental. Six of those um, have been um, non uh, quasi-experimental, but all of the studies that's ever been done on the strengths model has shown improvement. Um, and especially within outcomes such as reducing hospitalization, improved housing tenure, employment, reduced symptoms, uh, increased leisure time, social support, etc. So there, there's a, a nice building base to the strengths model. Um, some of those studies were done before we actually started to collect information on what we call now fidelity so that we know that to what degree is a team actually doing the things that we call the strengths model. And so the last study that we did is actually measured all the fidelity for all the teams right now in Kansas that we're working with. And all fidelity means is that um, how faithful are they to the model as it's, as it's presented. So if you look at that very top one, this is just one of the sites that we work with, um, the scale that we have is a 55 point scale. So you can imagine a score of 25 would mean that that team when they started at baseline was not really doing what we would call as the strengths model. And this isn't an indication of whether they're doing good or bad service. It's just an indication of where they are in relation to a very specific model of care. But this particular mental health center, um, you know, went all the way from no fidelity to a very high level of fidelity in 18 months. And what you can see also is that their outcomes improved as well from 8% employment to 26, hospitalizations, um, and that's um, um, state inpatient psychiatric hospitalizations went down extremely. Um, Post-secondary education really took a hit after about, uh, and took off in about 18 months. Independent living outcomes really have remained pretty stable. Um, and that's part of that is an indication of Kansas where housing is a lot easier to secure than in California. So apologize for that, but that's just the, the truth of the matter. It's a, a lower cost of living. But that's pretty much um, what we experience through most of the sites that we work with, that as fidelity improves, so does the outcomes as well. So there's a, a pretty good, nice base that we're building on there. And right now in Kansas, we have a little bit over half of all the community mental health centers that have achieved a high fidelity in this model. So, and if any of you want any of those research studies, um, I'd be happy to make those available to you. Um, go ahead and go on to the next slide. So since we're talking about the strengths model, want to talk about just a little bit what do we mean by strengths and I know that kind of seems um, pretty obvious but usually when we ask different audiences and we say think of someone that you know in your life and what are that person's strengths a lot of times we kind of go to qualities and personal characteristics you know that a person's hardworking or they're they've got a great sense of humor or they're um, they're honest they're creative they're uh, hard work, any, any kind of those things that are qualities. And while these are good things to know about people, they're actually the least important of all the four types of strengths in terms of helping people move forward in their recovery. In fact, a lot of times um, when we started working with sites that uh, kind of thought they were already working from a strengths model perspective, you would we would say, can you show us some evidence? And we would sometimes see where they would show us like, you know, this treatment plan that you know, you get to the fourth page and there's a little box that say, what are your strengths? And, and that's what you usually see in those boxes is qualities and personal characteristics. But we want to get to a little bit more in depth. So if you go to the next type of strength on there, it's talents and skills. And the more specific that you can get on these types of strengths, the more uh, usable they are. In fact, that's one term that we use is trying to help get strengths in their most usable form. You know, so for example, that, you know, you may have a person that you're working with that says, I like music. Well, that's nice to know, once again, and, and maybe there's some skill or talent involved in their musical abilities, but um, it doesn't really differentiate them from a lot of other people who also like music. And so you can kind of start to dig down into there in terms of, like, can they play a musical instrument and what do they play and, um, um, you know, how good are they? I mean, have they ever been uh, reimbursed? Have they ever used it for a job or um, just 
the more specific that we can get about people's talents and skills, the more we can think about how to mobilize those to help people achieve certain goals that they have in their life. And go on to the next one. Um, the next one is environmental strengths. So well, talents and skills can be things that are maybe uh, internal things of the person. The environmental strengths are those things outside the person that can also be used to help them move forward in their recovery. So this could be things like family members, it could be pets, it could be um, um, an education, it could be things that they may be involved with, it could be a church, it could be a social group, etc. And once again, just like with talents and skills, the more we get it down to its most usable form, the more specific, then the more useful it is. So it's one thing to know that a person that we're working with has a brother that they consider a strength, but it's probably more important for us to know is how that brother is a strength. So for example, it may be that that brother has a car, or that brother is a person who um, uh, maybe helps them financially out from time to time, or uh, a person in their life that when they're really feeling a lot of stress, it's a person that can go out with them and, and do something with them to kind of get them out of a situation. So environmental strengths, um, it, it's just like, for example, you could even look like at medications. You know, a person may say that they're struggling with um, you know, hearing voices, and one of the first things we would want to know is that what helps you with your voices. And sometimes those things can be environmental strengths, where a person might say, well, one thing that actually helps me when I'm hearing voices is when I wear headphones, especially if I'm traveling on the bus, because it helps me to tune that out. That's the kind of level of strengths that we're trying to get um, to help people. And then the last one on there is desires and aspirations. And these are just as important because sometimes people have an interest and an aspiration in something that they don't necessarily have a talent or a skill or an environmental strength to actually achieve something like that. But just the fact that it's an interest or an aspiration is a very strong internal motivation that makes it a strength. And sometimes that's the impetus that helps people do the hard work of sometimes even building on their own skills and talents or um, helping to broaden and expand their environmental strengths that they use. So, Rick, we've had a question related to this specifically. Sure. So Edwin um, from San Francisco asks, could we elaborate on what we mean by community strengths? In San Francisco, our teams always ask, where do we step down clients uh, once they no longer need our services? Does okay. community need outside the treatment system? Well, you know, I, I could talk about it pretty generally, but, you know, when we think about community strengths, we're really talking about finding the perfect niche for people. So I'll, I'll just give you one quick story example. It was a guy that I worked with that um, was kind of considered as low functioning. And so he was in lots of different types of groups. He had a hard time sometimes just caring for himself. Uh, um, you know, um, very kind of low intellectual level. So but the one thing that he knew was baseball cards. He really knew a lot about sports. And you would, you know, the one time that I remember going over to his uh, home and to see his large baseball collection, it was just amazing. And he could just tell you about players. He could give you statistics. It was pretty phenomenal. So that was kind of a strength of his is, is just this knowledge of baseball cards. And in that specific area, he was considered very high functioning. Um, well, he wanted to make more money and he was wanting to work and it was r r really hard for him to kind of find work because every job that he had tried he just really had a hard time being able to stay with it but you know within the community is that we had found this one place it was a baseball card uh, well actually it was a um, one of those um, like uh, markets that all they did is set up on on weekends and they had a little shop there that actually that they sold baseball cards and it was just a guy that um, did it on his own but uh, when I brought this particular client in just to meet that person he was amazed at his knowledge and, and he took him on as a, as, a, as a worker so he only worked one day a week but so that's an example of a community strength you know so you could you know when this guy went and applied at McDonald's it just did not go well that was not a strength for him but finding this niche where there was a match in the community where they needed something that matched with a strength that the client has. And so that, that's an example of pursuing an environmental strength that, you know, not only did he start making money from that, but he also also had a very nice relationship with the guy that actually owned the card shop.
you know, and sometimes it's even like uh, a community strength might even be a family member, but, you know, it's not just identifying a family as a generic strength, but sometimes really helping families to kind of find a role where they can be the most strength for a person. Uh, Rick, real quick, I want to give um, Edwin a chance to um, ask any further questions he has about this. Edwin, if whoever is on, uh, whose phone you're on, can you raise your hand? Or Edwin, if you're on your own, you need to put your audio pin in in order for me to unmute you. And Edwin, another one is that when we show the example, it might be another way for us just to draw out like what were the community strengths of that particular person. Okay. So Edwin, I was hoping to give you a chance to uh, dial in, but if you, your audio pin is 67, so put in pound, 67 pound to your phone, and then I can unmute you. Okay. Well, if, if he circles back, we'll come back to this and see if there were any other um, angles on this that he was interested in. Okay. So let's um, let's go ahead and put up an example of just a, a blank strengths assessment, if you can, Karen. So here's the strengths assessment tool, and and sometimes this gives fits to workers because it's um, it doesn't really tell you how to do it so much. It's it's organized by seven life domains. So if you kind of read down that middle column there, you'll see sections for like home and daily living, for people's assets that they have, uh, employment, education, and we've added specialized knowledge because sometimes people may not be getting paid for something or be in school, but um, they also sometimes have knowledge, and that's where like that knowledge of baseball cards would come out. And if you go down just a little bit, it has like social supports, um, supportive relationships, that is, uh, things on wellness and health. So that's where, you know, if a person had diabetes, you just don't put down diabetes. What you put is that, is there any ways that you're able to self-manage the diabetes right now? And anything that they would mention would become a strength. Um, things in terms of leisure recreational, and then there's also a space on spirituality culture. And so um, the one thing that you think about these domains is that just because there's a box here does not mean that you have to put something. So this is not constructed as an interview where you go in and say, tell me about your spirituality strengths or your culture strengths. But as you are in conversation with people and start to uncover different types of strengths, these are different types of domains where you can place those strengths. And this I'll show you later, it's, uh, it doesn't really matter where it goes. It's more important that you're capturing strengths um, and then trying to organize it than it is to, to get too concerned about exactly where it is. Um, go back up to the top, Karen, on the strengths assessment. So there's seven life domains, and there's also three temporal orderings. So if you go down each of the columns there, the one on the left are those current strengths that the person has. And that's usually where people's eyes kind of go to first. And so you really want to populate those with those strengths that are, are, are able to be used right now by the person or they're currently using to be able to, um, um, to, um, to contribute to their own health and wellness. And that middle column is what the person wants. Where, you know, what are their desires and aspirations in any of those areas? So, you know, a person may, um, you know, be saying that, you know, I want to get my own apartment um, or I want to have a roommate. And then the very last one is just past strengths. And what we kind of look at is that that middle column is you feed into it by things from the left, which is those things available now. But sometimes it can be very useful to look a little bit into the past and say, you know, how did you do things like this? So if your goal right now is to get your own apartment, can you tell me about, um, you know, the last time that you had your own apartment and, you know, you lived for, you know, four or five years, what helps you to be able to do that? And then those kind of things can maybe be used to be thinking about, like, what do we want to think about when you're going to try an apartment again? So let's go ahead. Real quick, I, I, I think... Edwin, if you're in with Juan, I've taken you off mute so you could ask your question again if you had follow-up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, that was helpful, Rick, because uh, sometimes we, we scratch our heads perhaps uh, in the wrong direction when we try to figure out what we're going to, quote-unquote, step down our clients into. Right. And 
we're thinking of like what 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 else can we give them after outpatient treatment when actually one of our strategies should be that they find their own that they're 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 on their own recognizance finding meaningful niches in the community and that we don't need to invent a wellness you know drop in center although we can still do that but but clients can be released upon their own recognizance uh, they will need medication support services and primary care services but but there's also a wealth of uh, things to do there in the community that they can connect with yeah you know a, a real key for us on you know like naturally occurring supports and is is that whenever we are working with people to establish a goal that they have in life. So whether it's a person that says, um, you know, I want to exercise more, that our first response is, um, you know, where do people in San Francisco go to exercise? How, you know, how does anyone in our community who doesn't have a mental illness pursue this type of goal? Or if you're in a community like uh, San Francisco, is that where do the people just in these neighborhoods that's close to where we work. Where do they go for exercise? And sometimes what happens is is that we, we go too quickly internally. So we start establishing exercise programs inside the mental health center or you know any, any kind of need a client would have and it makes it very difficult that by the time that they finish kind of like treatment that they really don't really have many anchors that are outside of our mental health centers and for a lot of people that's a very scary point in time and you, you sometimes experience people where they'll relapse just to kind of get back into mental health services or or they just you know put on the brakes and they just do not want to make a separation from people that have kind of been there with them for a long time so we're always trying to think about uh, how to help people find places where they feel comfortable and confident and, and and what we typically find is that when people have meaningful roles and places that they can thrive in the community they would much prefer that than in the mental health center anyway. But that's where that kind of slow process, um, you know, a lot of times is that uh, the most difficult people to work with this model are those people that have been in our systems of care for 10, 15, 20, 20, even more years because many people have kind of been socialized into disability or even sometimes into institutional type thinking, even if they're in the community. So sometimes when we're thinking about the sites that we work with now is that, you know, really work hard on those people that are first coming into your system, you know, the people that you're going to do an intake with next week, that we start working with them a little differently. Um, because in, in many ways we inherit, we're inheriting now some of the problems that, the, the problems that we have now have been inherited from things that we've created over the past 15, 20 years. Rick, there was another question from Anna. Anna, do you? I've taken you off mute. Can you speak into your computer? Okay. So Anna's question, Rick, is uh, I'll read it to you. I had a client reporting not liking himself when I wanted to closely explore strengths. I've reframed it as a strength, just the fact that he knew that he did not like himself. That was my effort to situate the client in thinking about strengths. I will love feedback. <laughs> um, you know, I'll, I'll almost try anything. If, if, if you can start getting a person um, thinking about strengths, um, you know, there's just so many different ways that you can try and it's going to work with some people and, and not work with others. But you do get sometimes people that have a hard time kind of, you know, themselves just stopping and thinking about strengths. And, you know, I'll just like, for example, I'll just go to my mom. My mom has dementia. You know, and if I go down to my mom and I ask her how she's doing, she's going to tell me every negative thing that's going on in her life. And that's just pretty typical how she does it. And if I would ask her what her strengths are, that she would say, you know, I'm 80 years old now. <laughs> don't, I don't have many strengths now. But, but if all of a sudden, if I helped her kind of look at her life in terms of, you know, um, you know, ask my mom, you know, what keeps you going, you know, um, she would tell you, she would tell you that, you know, what keeps me going in life is my grandkids. So all of a sudden it's like I see the interactions that she has with them and my grandkids, uh, just taking my kids down there can get my mom in the bath when no, no other way could do it. 
So sometimes it's, it's, it's not just coming out there so directly and just trying to get strengths. It is sometimes helping build a narrative for people that all of a sudden they start to see how different things interact in their life and give meaning and purpose. And, you know, and sometimes you're going to work with people that have kind of given up. You know, they sometimes start to view themselves as, you know, I have this permanent disability and um, maybe they're even starting to think about is life even worth kind of moving forward. And, you know, for some people it's, it's even just looking back a little bit. I mean, can you even remember a time when um, you didn't feel this way, that you actually thought that life was um, with worth living? And, what made that so? You know, so for some people, sometimes it's going into that conversation, and you know, even if a person does not see themselves as uh, good, uh, having strengths or healthy, um, we should never shy away from those conversations and even kind of opening them up because people are thinking about that regardless of whether we have the conversation or not. So sometimes, you know, we get a little bit worried that, oh, gosh, you know, I started talking about strengths and it really just kind of put them in a bad place. And, you know, I, I, you know, depending on your relationship with that person, sometimes that's not always a bad thing to sometimes, you know, when people start going through transitions in their mind, because it is a big shift when you start getting to the, um, to a point in your life when it's like, I've kind of accepted where I'm at, um, and maybe it's not worth putting a lot of energy in because I look back and I see all the things that I've lost in my life. And so now you're trying to get me to kind of think about tomorrow and next week. And that, that's, a very, that's a very vulnerable position with people. So I, what I would always say is just always be sensitive to that. But I would never um, stop trying to slowly kind of help people relook at their life in a different way. Um, and actually, if we go to the exam, if we go to the example strengths assessment, I think this is a great example of a person starting to see their life uh, differently. Um, so, uh, real quick, let Rick, while when doing that, there's a question from uh, Monica who says, um, "I have a question for Rick. How did he find the guy with the baseball card business?" Um, we actually, uh, it was at group supervision, which is one of the things that were on there. And so we were sitting as a team, and um, um, I just had asked that question: "Is that this is you know this is the only thing that this guy really sparks up and likes? Where um, where where can this guy do baseball cards?" And you know they thought all all the, these kind of different uh, things, and you know it just happened that one person on my team just says, "Is that you know I was out at the the flea market that's on uh, Market Street." and looking for some furniture and stuff and I just happened to see that they had a uh, baseball card shop and so um, I decided that uh, that next Saturday just to go out there with him and um, I flexed my time so we could go out there on a Saturday and it just kind of fell into place but you know it, it, it could have been one of those things that could have been another blocked door and that's where I kind of you know that's where we kind of can't give up. It's, it's, it's that, you know, as long as you have a goal, we'll keep trying. It doesn't, you know, it may not work here, it may not work there, but um, let's keep moving forward. Uh, can, Rick, one more question, then you tell us when you want to kind of hold off on questions. Okay. Uh, it says, I, this is from Anna again, I work with Tay and have great hope that they can recover. However, do not want to fall in the role of being the optimistic being optimistic when they are not there yet and jeopardize the relationship. Thanks for your feedback. Yeah. You know, I've had people ask me that before, you know, like, um, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to think of one woman who really just really struggled bad with voices and um, we were talking about recovery and stuff and, you know, she was saying, does this mean that I won't have to ever hear voices again? And, you know, I can't give any kind of guarantee. I said, I, you know, I really don't know. I said, you know, I've worked with people that have, you know, uh, go on to things that are very meaningful in their life and still hear voices. And what I've sometimes experienced is that, you know, they found a way to manage them to where that they're still present, but that they're not as interfering as they were. I said, I've worked with other people that sometimes have found just a right medication that really just did a great job of completely softening those kinds of things. And um, I don't know what that's going to hold for you. And so I never try to make any promises or if a person says that, uh, you know, do you think I can recover my, do you think I can get my kids back? Do you think I can get a job? And um, 
and I, my always kind of response is, is that, well, I hope so. I mean, I know that's important to you, and I, I'm willing to help you explore that. And for me, that's also about not taking ownership of people's goals. And that means is I, if, if I don't take ownership of it, I can't predict whether a person can or can't. But I'm willing to explore what it would take to make that goal a reality. And, you know, there's already going to be blocks out there for other people. I mean, like when you've got a person that says, I want to get my kids back, well, I'll explore what it might take. Um, I just don't ever want to be a barrier myself or when I've had my staff, don't you be a barrier um, because there's enough things that prevent people from actually achieving goals that they want. But if you have a sincere commitment, you know, that, that's 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 very good for a lot of people and they can tell when you're really sincerely invested and that actually in itself prompts a lot of energy because that's really the only way that you can get people to kind of move forward in their life is if they have the energy um, and they'll feed off you a lot so I don't mind being optimistic um, I'd always like to be viewed more as as just being hardworking that I'm not going to give up. So one of those things is that I'm willing to hold hope when you can't carry it for yourself. Because I've seen other people achieve goals like this before. I've also seen people that have not been able to do it. And I can't rule out the fact that this isn't something that you're going to be able to achieve. It's just like the question when people say, well, you're going to be my case manager next year, and I can't even guarantee people that because I don't know what the future is going to hold, but it's like, you know, but I'll give you 100% of my time while I'm working here. And, and I think that's always the best approach that I've always found is just being real with people, being sincere. They can pick up on that, and they, they know, and when you use tools like this, it takes a little bit of time and effort, and so you don't go to this time and effort unless you really believe that something can happen and that right in itself sends a message to the person that you you, you really think it's worth it spending them as, this much time to me searching this stuff out and it's like well yeah I do because because the keys in here so Elizabeth's an example I did not work with Elizabeth but I was working with a team where we were helping them implement the strengths model of case management and um, one of the staff wanted me to go out and do field mentoring and show them how they would do a strength assessment with a particular person. And the reason they picked Elizabeth on here, which the name's been changed and so is the information, was the fact that Elizabeth had been constantly in and out of hospitals. She um, very frequent suicidal ideation. She caught on herself. Uh, she only lived on her own one time in her life and it only lasted for five months. And She got really sick and she went back out on the street. Then she went into the apartment, I mean uh, back into the hospital, went back to her family, which is a kind of a very bad living arrangement as it was. Um, she kind of grew up with a lot of uh, abuse, um, emotional abuse, physical abuse. and. So Elizabeth was one of those people that, you know, and, and she was always bugging staff that, uh, you know, constantly calling the crisis hotline or she was calling um, um, the case manager. So they just said, you know, what can we do? So we went out there and we started doing the strength assessment. And this strength assessment that you see right here was not completed in just one visit. It was probably about three visits before we put all this together and I think Elizabeth was very suspicious even that very first time because it was a big shift for her and I think she tried to put as much negative of why she couldn't do things as she was trying to say things she wanted. I mean she very clearly said that she wanted her own apartment. She knew exactly where she wanted to live but then she would go through all the yes buts of why that was never going to happen. Um, including her parents being blocking her and those things. But we just kept pushing on, pushing on, and um, this is what we ended up with. And so I want you just to take just a few minutes and look at this strengths assessment and then kind of compare what you see about Elizabeth through this strengths assessment versus the other story that I told you about kind of what was going on in her life. So just, just take a couple minutes and y you've got hard copies of that hopefully in front of you. Um, take a look at that and then I'd like to hear from you all about what do you see in terms of strengths. Um, and this is maybe one of those questions where we can ask what are, where are the community strengths in here?
Rick, I'll just ask folks to raise their hands and to, to speak up, and I'll unmute them. Okay, sounds good. So what do you think? Um, how, how do you see this kind of tool? Useful, helpful, information that you see that might actually contribute to a person's recovery, um, benefits to collecting this type of information in addition to maybe looking at barriers. So Rick, I'm unmuting so you can speak up. Okay. okay. Except for those where we get reverb. Okay. So, I, guys, just so you know, I'm unmuting you. Is there anybody that I'm sharing? One said I have a brother, but he's gone. Yeah. So, uh, I'm from okay. San Francisco. Hello? Go ahead. Yeah. So, I just want to highlight a, a point here that we've been to San Francisco which is, you know, medical compliance, as you know, and our understanding of medical compliance and perhaps some of our practice as a result has been to focus on impairments, you know, like somebody gets hospitalized a lot or somebody has anger, uncontrollable, property damaging behavior or um, <clears throat> person gets hospitalized a lot, that those kinds of stuff seem to become the subject of our service and treatment planning efforts. So this is kind of a change. And um, I think one of, the, one of the learnings that we have to do is how to incorporate these kinds of personal, positive, aspirational goals of the client into something that will be uh, acceptable for uh, medical treatment planning purposes. Yeah, thank you uh, for making those points. You know, I, I think um, when you th go back to that second principle of the strengths model, that the focus on strengths versus deficits, but at the same time, you know, we never have to ignore problems, barriers, and challenges, and nor should we. I mean, if a person has a substance abuse problem that actually is getting in the way of them being able to do certain things, well then um, we should make that known. And, and we, we do want to try to help a person be able to overcome that particular barrier in their life. And even when I think about Elizabeth here, I mean there's, there's plenty of problems that we can focus on. Um, definitely like the cutting behavior that she has and the, the frequent hospitalizations and um, the suicidal, all those kind of things we can think about. Um, but we have to start thinking about like how can we overcome those types of things and how do we go through that and you know a, a very important thing is that if we look at Elizabeth where she is now um, and we're talking about um, well, I can't remember how many years now um, I'm guessing probably maybe seven years anyway but um, her hospitalization is uh, uh, greatly decreased uh, the suicidal behavior stuff uh, greatly decreased. So we kind of accomplished that goal of doing exactly what uh, we want to do through our funding sources. Um, but it's like what's the most effective way to help people do those and when I think of like substance use is you know the best way to, to get a person um, clean and sober is for there to be a reason for them to be clean and sober. So something to fight for and something to build on you know rather than just um, you know I'll wait and see you next week and we'll see if you stayed clean I mean how do we start building those things so that uh, the person has some stable ground to start making steps forward and so that's all you're doing on here is that you're not taking away those things that determine medical necessity because if we if we if we only needed to collect strengths well then we would start to say well why do we even need to be involved people could just set their goals and then we could just tell them to go out and do it well go get your apartment and uh, you know go get a job but we know that there are reasons why people have difficulty doing those things and so you acknowledge those things even within a treatment plan but you drive it as something like like with Elizabeth you know I want to be able to um, 
you know, I want to be able to stay out of the hospital so that I can get a job. Um, I want to be able to better learn to self-manage the depression so that I can um, have more friends in my life to do things with so I can actually get out of the house and get involved in things that I enjoy. So you kind of start to pair those, that it's the people's aspirations that go forward, but then all the stuff that's collected on the strengths assessment are those things that we use to help Elizabeth kind of gain on her ground. So if you look at, um, anybody see some strengths in there that they just really kind of thought, you know, well, that could really be powerful for somebody in recovery? And this would just chat them in or put them in as a question? <clears throat> to help manage our our sound. Muted. So Rick, I'm not seeing questions coming in. Well, I'll give you one just to kind of get you started on there is um you know the the one up there that says enjoys country music. It's amazing that, you know, like for example, um, when we were actually talking to her mom, the mom always said that, you know, she always spends all of her damn time in that, in her room, just listening to music. And, but Elizabeth saw it as a strength. You know, there was a place where she was getting respite, but there was something about it, and it was the desire, and there was something about just the, the lyrics and stuff that actually gave her strength and stuff. And the biggest thing is that when she finally got out and started trying to dance again, and that was actually a very big thing. Also, she had a great singing voice. And when we start thinking of community resources, eventually one of the things that she ended up doing was actually singing in a church choir. And it was when those kind of things started matching. It's like this beautiful voice that she had, which um, um, never got a chance to really kind of share that gift, but then was able to put it in something else that was important, which was her faith, that, uh, that's a, that was a great match. That was a niche for her. So Rick, for time's sake, I think we need to go on. Okay. So let's let's talk about different ways that you can use the strengths assessment. And there's just lots of ways. Uh, keep going through that, Karen. Um, you know, one is that it, it, it's a tool that can help you just to get to know the other person as part of engagement. So it doesn't even matter if a person already has a goal or they don't have a goal. It's just the way for us to kind of begin that working relationship. And it begins that context for developing the helping relationship, which, which is the next point, Karen. Um, so that, you know, if a person says is that, you know, I really would like to get my own apartment, well, that's the way you can kind of introduce that strengths assessment. It also helps the person envision and communicates their recovery journey. You know, when you start doing that strengths assessment for Elizabeth, it started to become very clear what a meaningful, um, purposeful, and uh, a positive self-identity would look like for Elizabeth. Um, and that started anchoring a future. It also amplifies the well aspects of the person. There's a lot of people that we work with that sometimes see themselves even sometimes as damaged goods. And it's a way for them to start look at themselves in a little different light that um, there's not a person that doesn't have strengths. If you go on to the next one is um, it also can be used to develop strategies. Um, to achieve goals, and it's kind of like what I was talking about to where we identify the baseball cards or for Elizabeth, the singing and the faith community and matching those together. It's also a way to celebrate people's accomplishments over time, and um, here in just a bit I'll show you Elizabeth's uh, strength assessment over time, and you'll see that um, it changes. You don't want to just have this as a piece of paperwork that you do at one time and it stays in the chart. But another one is that it highlights the seemingly ordinary things in a person's life that contributes to their recovery. Things that just didn't seem like they made that much of a difference really kind of have some very powerful attributes that a person can use to be active participants in their own recovery rather than being just passive recipients to our services or like medications and things. So how do you get this type of information on a strengths assessment? Well, some of it's the content. Can we keep going on the next one, Karen? is that um, you know it's written in a context that's meaningful and important to the person it's hope inducing you should definitely a person should feel good when they see that and thorough detailed and specific is what I was talking about when you don't want to just know that they have a brother in their life but how is the brother a strength 
and it should be written from the person's perspective. So hopefully when you were looking at Elizabeth's strengths assessment, you saw things like I want, and they were written in her language, and there was quotes. Um, this is her assessment, um, not just a way of us looking at a person. So go ahead and go on to the, um, um, let's go ahead and can you just real quickly show Elizabeth's strength assessment at six months, Karen? So six months later, you kind of start to see the strength assessment changing. Now there's not this hard kind of line that says, you know, when do you need to redo a strength assessment? Um, we see it as evolving. And a good strength assessment uh, isn't even typed up. I mean, we type this one here, but when we were working on Elizabeth's, um, you know, you start off with a bunch of scratch things on it, and then sometimes, you know, you'll see different colored pen, and you just add things as you go along, and then things start changing columns, and sometimes you even find coffee stains on them. They just look really messy and dirty. And then finally you get to the point to where it's so messy that you, you just decide to go ahead and start a whole new one and start to really shift. And that's what we did Elizabeth right here is that she had had so much shifting in her domains and columns that so things now that like she said, I want to get that apartment at Hitchcock Towers, well that now becomes a current strength. And so now there are things about that apartment that are strengths for her like, you know, the exercise room and, you know, she has her things, she has a grocery store next by. And now she has new types of aspirations, so not just wanting to get an apartment, but now it's like, I wouldn't mind getting a cat. So really what we're trying to do is help people really keep moving forward in their recovery. So not just try to treat a symptom but really helping people build a life. So how do we help people get to these points? And that's where that next tool comes in, the personal recovery plan. And uh, do you want to just show a copy of that real quick? Well, let me just, I'll go through these and then we'll show a copy. So the personal recovery plan is, is this shared agenda between the worker and the client to help them actually make progress towards their goals. So this should flow from a treatment plan, but it's not this thing that is done annually. This is something that you have in front of you when you're working with the person. So if you use it regularly, like every time that you get together with somebody who actually has a goal, then it'll drive the nature of the work and the activities so that you start working from purposeful work rather than this reactive passive kind of work where you show up like you know Tuesday at three o'clock and say so what's going on today um, and trying to build an agenda that way you're really starting to think about what is something that we can do either between next meeting or at the next meeting to help you take another step in this goal that you want in your life so hopefully that you're inviting clients to achieve a sense of success because you know we, we look at the overall goal but there, it's, it's worthy of just celebrating every step that a person makes because um, it is a heroic journey for a lot of people even to accomplish some simple goals um, whether it's you know getting their driver's license or you know just getting involved in something like Elizabeth did in a church when she hadn't done that for a while so um, why don't we just go ahead and just actually put up Elizabeth's personal recovery plan, and that's probably the best way for me just to explain the... This one? Yeah. So when do you introduce a personal recovery plan like this? Um, you know, we would see that the strengths assessment would be, would be done with every person that you work with, but you only introduce the personal recovery plan when a person's identified a passionate goal that they want help with. So like Elizabeth, I want my own apartment. And why does she want that apartment? Because she wants more freedom and she wants to prove to herself and her family that she can do this. So there's passion in that. And that's a great time to bring out a personal recovery plan is that that's what you want in your life. Let's start making some steps towards it. And there's no guarantee that she'll ever even achieve it. But it goes back to that one thing is that where do we start? How would anybody go about starting a, a, a goal like this? Um, but it doesn't even have to be a, a passionate goal. It could be just a goal that that would be more likely achieved it was broken down into smaller steps. So uh, I've used a personal recovery plan for a person who was just applying for Social Security. And it kind of felt overwhelming to the person. So just by having something that kind of breaks it down, then that was very helpful to them just to take some movement. You know, or you could even have a goal that's kind of vague and just needs to be explored further. So you have a client that just says, I don't even know what I want in my life. I just want to be happy. Well, take what you can get 
and why don't we start to kind of just explore some things that might actually take you in this direction and maybe as we go along we'll start to define it more and then we can pull that into a plan that actually says okay this is something that you want to achieve that you feel like would make you happy in your life so um, so what's all going on here uh, well, there's a statement of the goal, that's what we have up there at the top, and why it's important to the person, but then there's space to break down the goal into measurable, smaller steps. And just like the strengths assessment is not done at one time, well, the same thing here. You don't just get a goal and then plan out the 30 steps that you're going to be taking over the next uh, 90 days. It's really an iterative process where all you need is one step to take movement into the next appointment you have. Uh, no more than maybe two or three steps. But like in Elizabeth's case, it was just, um, you know, why don't we just talk to the landlord at Hitchcock Towers and just ask if there are any openings, and she agreed to do that. And she got an application, and so it wasn't really until the next time that they got together that they actually said, we're going to fill out the application, and then between the next appointment, let's make a list of all the things that are needed for the new apartment. So. Every time that they got together until this goal was achieved, there was only one or two steps added to it because we sometimes can't even guarantee what's going to happen um, as a result of one step. Elizabeth could have went to the landlord at Hitchcock Towers and they said, no, there's not any openings and I don't think we're going to have openings for another year. Well, then that's where you sit down. What do we want to do next? Do we want to wait for another year or do we want to explore other apartments? And depending on her answer to that is, what we decide to do for the next week. So that's why you want to keep these things small, but the important thing is that you just want movement. And that's so critical for the people that we work with is that we just start getting movement. Um, and sometimes people get lost on the way that the goal that was out there is not the one that you actually end up with. So there's a place to sign who's responsible for doing the goal, and hopefully you want to see that the person's name's on there. And you want to see a section where you designate when each step is uh, projected to be accomplished and when it is. And if you look at the dates on there, they're all kind of in small chunks. Um, and so that was done in 2008. So, I mean, that was six years ago. That, um, and it's amazing just the progress that she's already made just in six years. Any comments just about the, the personal recovery plan as it is right now? And Rick, we had another question about the strength assessment. Do you want to go back to that or wait until the end? Sure. Let's, let's do the strength assessment, and then we'll see if we have any on the personal recovery plan. So Monica asked, I have another question for Rick. What is his position on having the individual take a strength assessment form to complete it? I was thinking of doing it with an individual who already does homework as part of our treatment. I was yeah. thinking that I could give her a sample one to take with her, and then I could review it in the following session. Yeah, I think um, it's going to always be individual on that, but you're right. If, if you've got a person that is kind of already making some good strides with their recovery, so they've already got kind of an insight on some of the things that they do well, I think that's a great assignment where, you know what, um, why don't we do this together? You go off and do the strengths assessment, you come back, and why don't we kind of compare some notes and we'll try to create a collaborative one together. Um, but I've had lots of people that, you know, I've seen workers where they just decide to give it to the client, and we just don't really think of ourselves in strength. So for a lot of people, that's not going to work. Um, I mean, I know it's if, if I gave it to my son and said, you know, go off and identify all your strengths for me, <laughs> I don't know what he would come up with, but he might find it very valuable if I pointed out things that I've seen or at least gauged him in conversation and things that he talked about that we recorded on there and I showed him why we were gathering that type of information. So Monica, what I would say is that if you've got a person that that would be beneficial and they would enjoy doing it, by all means have them do it. The most important thing is that when they come back is that you make a decision on how you're going to use that information. And sometimes what it is, they may come back with some very overarching strengths that you then help them drill down. So it's like, you know, you, you put your mom here as a strength, but can you tell me a little bit more about how that's a strength? Or you put on here that playing the piano is a strength for you, but can you tell me a little bit more like how that's a strength for you? What does it do? What's the active ingredient? 
because that's when it starts to become valuable for the person when they start to make a connection of how I actually use strengths in, in, our, in my life, their life. And all of us do that. I mean, whether we're conscious of it or not, that, you know, um, if you think about what you're going to go do tonight, you will build on your strengths, whatever that is. Um, that's just how we all make our way in life, and it's how we keep ourselves well, and it's how that we gather meaning and purpose. We just don't really think of those things as strengths, but if you had somebody that kind of pointed all those connections out to you, you would say, oh, exactly. That's how I live my life. I don't go home and think about what are all the deficits I have in my life and you know, how can I cope with them. We think about, we, think, we, 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 we take steps on things that are solid ground for us. Um, any reactions to the personal recovery plan? So, Rick, I don't see any uh, questions coming in. Anything more specific? Um, no, why don't, I, why don't I go on a little bit? You know, sometimes it's always kind of hard sometimes to think about, like, what do you ask uh, in a webinar? And um, So let me go on a little bit more, and then maybe that will kind of spur some questions. So go ahead and go on to the next slide, Karen. And go even one more on that. So some of it's like, where do you get this stuff for the personal recovery plan? Well, this is where that link between the strengths assessment and the personal recovery plan is. And hopefully the reason that you're doing a strengths assessment is to start to identify those things that bring meaning and purpose and things that are good recovery-oriented goals that actually take them outside of the mental health system in some way. Um, and so that... in her life, but that doesn't mean that they're all given the same importance or maybe she doesn't even have, she's not at a place of readiness for pursuing a lot of those things. Like one of the things that she had in there is that she wouldn't mind having a job working with children. Well, that might not, that's something that she might desire in her life at some point, but it's not something that she wants to start working on tomorrow. So there's a lot of discussion with that strengths assessment about where to start and I always go from that theory of movement. I don't really care where we start as long as it starts kind of moving you forward. In Elizabeth's case, it was, I want to get my own apartment. So you write those things in the person's own words. Um, you don't want to reframe them in terms of um, treatment jargon. You know, no matter what you end up having to write inside your treatment plan, you know, if a person says is that, you know, I'd really like to have a, a few friends in my life to just go and do things on weekends, well, then you can write that actually on a personal recovery plan. You don't want to reframe it as is that increased socialization because then it just kind of takes the life out of it. And this really is a relational model of, of really trying to align with the person on something that they get excited about and taking movement. So it's specified as precisely as the person understands it. And we talk a lot about when doing the personal recovery plan that sometimes you have to go slow to go fast. So, you know, if a person says, I want a job, uh, that doesn't mean we just have to go put them in the, the first place that we know where there's an opening in town. Um, what does that mean to them? You know, why do they want to work? Um, you know, a person might, you know, it really has nothing to do with money. It's just that I'd like something to do and I'd like to be around people. Well, then, you know, getting them a job at, uh, you know, a third shift back in a warehouse where there's no other people is probably not a good, um, you know, job match. Uh, you no, know, our person says, well, you know, I want to work with animals. Well, then, you know, that's, you try to understand as much as you can about why a person wants to do something. And sometimes things shift, you know. So, like, for example, you know, you have a person that, you know, will say, like, I want to lose weight. Well, I mean, you could put that down if you wanted to, but I think it's better to try to understand why that's important to the person. So, you know, for one person, it might be that, well, I want to lose weight because I feel like if I do that, it might enhance my ability to meet somebody that, that finds me attractive. Well, that's really the goal. 
because a person could lose 100 pounds and not meet anybody and they've not accomplished their goal. And the person could actually gain 10 pounds and meet the person who becomes the love of their life and they've met that goal. So it was never about losing weight anyway. It was really about what was underneath that. So we try to always think about what a person's wanting out of the goals because that's the best way to keep them kind of moving forward and investing, invested in it. And then last, it's not debated, <clears throat> but rather accepted and further explored. And the only exceptions on that is like if a, a goal is illegal or unethical. But other than that, it's like, um, let's explore it. And I've worked with some people that had some pretty wild and ambitious goals, but we still explored it. You know, you know, like a person that I had that wanted to be a pilot, and I thought, boy, that's you know, that's that's a long stretch to go from being homeless for 15 years to being a pilot. But you know, it's uh, let's explore it. And the guy ended up actually about four or five years later ended up becoming a baggage handler out at the airport where we lived. And so, did he become a pilot? No. But after we started making movement, he found the niche. He found the place where actually gave him meaning and purpose, and that's where he ended. Um, um, that's just the standards for setting goals. Um, you know that if you're going to write things down, um, you really think about that you just don't want to write vague steps. I mean, you really want to put them in positive terms. You want a high probability of success. So what that may mean is, you know, don't say, you know, um, you know, go explore job opportunities this month. I mean, make it something specific that's measurable and observable. Like, um, you know, do you want to go pick up an application at that place you were talking about? And, you know, you may have a person that's like, uh, they just don't have a lot of confidence. Well, do you want us to go together and actually go pick up an application? Um, so specific, small, time limited, and it's understandable and meaningful to the person. So if they're going to do a step on a personal recovery plan, they see how it relates to something that they want to do. And I'll give you an example on Elizabeth. I don't think it showed up on the personal recovery plan that we had there, but we helped her develop a RAP plan. Well, you know, it would have been one thing that they actually tried to get her to do a RAP plan when she was still living um, in her house uh, with her parents because they thought, well, that would help her maybe manage her symptoms and, you know, not feel as suicidal. But she just never wanted to do it because it wasn't relevant to her. By the time we started making steps and we were actually getting to the point where she was going to be moving in a couple weeks, she really kind of wanted to do that rap plan because she started thinking about, well, what happens if I get in that apartment and then all of a sudden I start feeling like um, I want to kill myself and I, I don't know what to do. So you, you, you kind of wait until things are relevant. And then what we typically find is that people are mo more motivated to do something if they see how it has a connection to something that they want. So, and Rick, real quick, speaking of folks wanting something, the uh, folks from San, San Francisco want to ask you a question. All right, great to Hi, Hi Rick. Um, hey, hey. This is Edwin. So uh, could you give us a few words about what is the relationship between the DHCS medical required uh, treatment plan the strengths assessment and the personal recovery plan, given that all three of them are dealing with achievement of clients' goals, how how yeah. do they how do they work with each other? Right. What was the first thing that you said? That, that is that your thing that's based on medical necessity? Yeah, and it okay. has a lot of components that that are, are not part of the strengths assessment format. R right. Um, how do they all work together? Yeah, you know, well, I mean, first of all, that uh, I don't have any difficulty with medical necessity, and I know that you know when we think about the the work that we do, that there's there's a limited amount of money, and so we definitely want to target those to people that need it, and we also want to target it towards things that um, we have a role to actually help people do things. So when I think about whatever we fill out in terms of medical necessity that it, it very much spells out why we need to be involved and that's why when I was talking about like you know pairing something um, you know in a strength assessment you might uncover that a person wants to work or get their own place or they want to stay out of the hospital or whatever it is that's meaningful they want to I want to have a relationship with my kid again who I haven't seen in 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 in, in, in seven years or whatever it is and then we start thinking about in terms of 
what is our role in this? I mean, why do we need a paid mental health worker to help you get a job or help you get your house or help you establish a relationship with your kid again? So I think that's where that when you can answer that question of why you need to be involved, then that's a really easy connection of how you fill out that, um, that treatment plan that's going to be centered on medical necessity. So what the strengths assessment or the connection is, is that one, is that it pairs it so that it's not just about, you know, like for example, reducing symptoms. We see that all the time. Well, that's a, that sounds like great medical necessity, but it kind of leaves out the person. I mean, one is that why would they want to um, uh, reduce symptoms and when do we even know when to stop uh, reducing symptoms? So, you know, when I always think about it, it's like if a person's saying that I want to be able to better manage the racing thought so I can concentrate at work, well, that's how you know when you've helped them to be able to better manage the racing thoughts is when they can actually go to work and they can complete, um, you know, work activities and the, the thoughts don't interfere. So that's where that connection is, is that the strengths assessment should basically start to anchor yourself where you're going. It should kind of put that thing out there that says um, this is what we're trying to get to. And, and when you do a strengths assessment, it doesn't mean that you have to do everything. There's lots of things that are going to be on there that people want that you won't even have a role in. We don't need to take over people's lives. So when I think about that treatment plan, you're taking out parts of that strengths assessment where we have a role. And that's where we're focusing our treatment efforts on. Where the personal recovery plan comes into it is that what we don't want to do is just kind of have this, um, you know, vaguely defined thing of treatment. Like, okay, we kind of do what we do with all clients. You take your medications as prescribed, you follow through with your appointments, you do this, you do that. But we're making it individualized so that we can start to know when to separate different things. So what a good personal recovery plan tells us is that there's going to be things that we start finding out that people can do for themselves, and then that just kind of drops away from the treatment plan. But it also starts to maybe define our niche even more clear about what keeps them involved with us, and let's let that start to become the focus of what remains within our treatment plan. So what I think, at least my own experience, is that over time when you're using all those three things together, hopefully your role is going to diminish over time. And if it doesn't diminish over time, and it's going to happen, you're going to have some people that have such very severe cognitive impairments that they're going to be with us for a while. Well, at least what we're starting to do is start to think about how do we help this person um, be able to take over some ownership of more aspects of their lives so that we're not kind of doing everything and they're living a passive existence. Because if we get to that point, you're talking about a person who's a very high risk of suicide. You're talking about a person who's very uh, risk of sometimes even um, you know relapsing the drugs and alcohol. So I don't know if that completely answers your question, but I think there's you know it's it's there's a powerful thing when you put all of those three things together in terms of giving direction to our work and hopefully helping us achieve the ultimate outcome that we want is helping people move beyond our immediate systems of care. If not, when we only rely just on that kind of treatment plan, we kind of see what we've seen in a lot of different programs, you know, over the last 15, 20 years is that we just don't really see that much movement. So, and not that this model is going to guarantee that you're going to get movement, but what it does is that it helps create the conditions in which sometimes people are more likely to step, take a step and to become I mean, active participants in their own recovery and wellness. And you're going to see it happen with some people, and you're going to see some people where it's going to take them a long time before they feel comfortable taking another step forward. They become very uh, used to the way services are right now, and sometimes they like it. So, Rick, we've got about um, just over five minutes, so we need to kind of quickly go through the rest. I've only got a, just a few more things on it, and I'm really not going to go over these things, but just to kind of tell you, uh, you know, the first one is our, our group, you know, the supervisor is an extremely important part of this model. Because what you can imagine is just like what you've said is, you know, you've had questions like, well, how do you do this in this circumstance? And what we like to see is a supervisor being involved to the point that we help people develop the skills to do almost any kind of situation. Doesn't mean they're going to do it perfectly, but you start building that repertoire. 
So we recommend that a supervisor, and we do this within all of our project sites where they're implementing the models, they carve out two hours a week doing strengths-based group supervision. What that does is that's the place where you know I'm stuck. You know, I, persons I've been using the strengths assessment. We pulled out this goal for like say Elizabeth to get her own apartment, but I'm really stuck with where do I go? Well, it's just kind of like what you asked the question about the baseball card thing. I didn't know where you take people to go do baseball card stuff, but I have a team that can help me actually take another step, and that's what that's used for. And then there's also two hours a week reviewing the tools, and so you you want to you want a supervisor that's going to help you make those the most powerful. So giving you feedback on, you know, hey, you've got some great stuff here. And based on this goal, you might want to see if you can actually get a little bit more depth into a few of these strengths because they may actually play a key in you being able to help this person take a step. So you're reviewing tools, you're giving staff feedback, and, and then the field mentoring, which is like that's how I went and helped the case manager who actually did the strengths assessment for Elizabeth. I went out there and I modeled it. But I also go out there, you know, with with the staff and have them actually do it, and then I observe them and give them feedback. And in some cases, we actually do it together, and I prompt their skills. So that's that's just the whole eight-hour supervisor. But it, it's very critical for helping people learn these skills. And what we do in our sites is that you know, once you start getting things like the strengths model stuff down. You know, it's a great format for helping people learn things like motivational interviewing and really truly getting those into their practice or learning, you know, cognitive, uh, you know, behavioral type strategies, um, dialectical behavioral kind of stuff. There's so many ways that you can go with this in terms of skill building. So the next slide on there is just the group supervision process. I'm not going to go through that on there. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a weekly meeting. Um, you do it 90 minutes, two hours a week. Um, and you're really just going over about two or three clients, and that's it. But you're doing it more in depth than you typically would because you want people to leave with very concrete ideas based on a person's strengths that helps them take movement. So the next slide that Karen will put up there is just the process. And, um, um, you know, I have things that are writing on that. So if any of you would, you know, want any writing on, on what group supervision is and how you do it, um, I'd be happy to send it to someone in your agency or you can request that from Karen, I'll get it to you. And that'll give you a more in-depth description of what group supervision is and how you do it. And the same thing with the next slide is that how do you go about field mentoring. So any last questions? Um, was this helpful? Rick, we had a couple of them. Um, Jack Joyner says, he's made a fun comment, it seems that the PRP is very similar to the movie What About Bob? Baby Steps. So, <laughs> Jack, can you uh, fill us in a little bit more on that? I think it requires no further explanation. What do you think? Yeah. You know, it really is. Um, it's it's really about movement. That's always the kind of word. Um, you know, it's just like with my kids. Um, you know, sometimes they have it's just like how do you get them motivated, especially as teenagers kind of go forward and you know what I try to do is just find an area where they're passionate and try to get them moving in the world and it's it's amazing the kind of life things that you can work around that rather than just say you know here's an out of context thing that I just want you to learn or I just want you to experience um, movement. And for a lot of people that we work with just have not experienced a lot of movement. So when you talk about like those baby steps, um, you know, they may seem very simple and basic for, for us, but for some people that we work with, that's a pretty major accomplishment. But I think the other part is that you see a connection between those baby steps and even something bigger because there has to be relevancy to it. Was there another question, Karen? Yes, there was. Um, Anna asks, do you think that we have to put the developing strengths in a continuum that also has awareness of the challenges we have we clinicians address in treatment? Um, say that again. Try to... uh, let's see if Anna can speak up so that she can. Anna, are you on your computer? Can you uh, describe your question again? Is Anna in the same room with uh, Juan and others? In another uh, place. 
Choose another place, okay. Okay, well, I'll make up an answer that just feels good to me that may even not answer the question. Um, I don't know if I was kind of getting that, but in terms of like a continuum, um, I, I don't even, I don't really view things as continuum. I just kind of view things as just um, um, going out there, and I don't think you have to do anything before anything else. Um, like, for example, you know, I learned how to live on my own by living out on my own. I learned how to work by actually working, and so sometimes is that it's, through sometimes doing things and sometimes even failing that actually that you learn things that you can go forward and you know I've had you know, it's just like my mom my, my mom wanted to pay her own bills and she has a hard time and we had to go through a lot of times where you know she had her uh, um, you know utility shut off but you know it's like it would have been it was a lot better for me to kind of let her experience some of that and get right in there with her than it was to say you know what mom I'm taking all this away from you and I'm gonna set this up and I'm gonna pay your bills for you and um, you know, we found a happy medium to where that she has some control and autonomy, and I'm also able to offer her support. But some of that was is that just testing out of what a person can do. So sometimes you have strengths that come out through those things, and sometimes even the deficits come out. Um, but I think the the key thing is keeping people as the director of that helping process and their learning. Because the bottom line for me is that it's their recovery journey. Um, you know, I go to I, I go home at the end of the day and I go do things on weekends. But you know, the people that we work with, they live through this 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So um, how do I keep them moving forward in a way that uh, they can live with? Uh, Rick, the folks from Imperial have asked to get the uh, Pawnee Strengths Model Project data. Okay. Yeah, what I'll do is, um, Karen, we'll get we can get together on this and uh, pull some stuff. But I'll uh, I'll send um, the study that we did in 2012 that took all of the Strengths Model sites and it shows the relationship between fidelity and outcomes. And the Pawnee Project was a part of that. Okay. Okay. We'll make that available to folks. Yeah. And uh, that we're, we're a minute past, so unless there's any final burning questions, I think we will wrap up. So folks, raise your hand or chat in. OK. Well, Rick, uh, really wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for covering that. And I know that it's hard when you get, don't get to see people and interact more directly. So thank you for bringing good energy to it. Really, really. Uh, found it useful, and hopefully our team members are excited about it. Good, good. And if, if anything you think of after this, um, feel free to send those questions on, and we can see what we can do to answer them. Okay. All right. Talk to you Thanks all later. Everybody. Have a great Bye. afternoon. Bye-bye.